Welcome to our UC Davis Mind Institute Facebook Live, where our experts provide information about neurodevelopmental disabilities. Today, we'll be learning about Project ECHO, an interactive teleconferencing program for providers of autistic patients. The goal is moving knowledge, not patients, and new ECHO sessions are available starting in May. I'm Marianne Sharp, and joining me today are three experts from the UC Davis Mind Institute who are on our ECHO team. Bibiana Restrepo is a developmental behavioral pediatrician, an associate clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics and a Mind Institute faculty member. She has expertise in diagnosing and providing medical treatment to children and adolescents with complex medical conditions, particularly autism. Amber Fitzgerald is a board certified behavior analyst, educational specialist in moderate to severe disabilities, and a program manager at the Mind Institute. She has expertise in special education and the implementation of evidence-based practices for children with autism. She works on several projects, including ECHO, Project Impact, and the Mind the Gap study. And Sarah Dufek is a psychologist and faculty member at the Mind Institute and an assistant professor of clinical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She is an expert in the assessment and treatment of autism across the lifespan in the clinical and research contexts. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Hi. Hi. All right. If you, you have any questions, oh, it is my pleasure. Um, if you have any questions, please do post them in the comments on Facebook, and we will answer them toward the end of our discussion. All right, I think we should start with what does ECHO stand for, and what is it? Um, let's start with you, Sarah Dufek. Sure. So ECHO, the acronym itself, stands for uh, Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And it was actually a program that was developed at the University of New Mexico. And it was uh, based on the way medical providers do rounds. It's like a rounds approach where um, specialists or sort of, you know, well-established um, clinicians would interact with trainees back and forth to, to gain knowledge across both sides. Um, and the idea is that learning is lifelong and everyone can learn from each other. And it's a very guided practice model. Um, and this ECHO model has been um, used in lots of different areas of fields of healthcare and education and uh, civics areas. And the idea is that you can leverage things like telehealth or using a video model, such as we're using right now to communicate with each other. Um, and ECHO really takes advantage of that. So it's been used for um, everything from, for example, like um, you know, connecting experts in the field of cardiology with um, folks who uh, support people who use those um, uh, techniques, design and communication there. And then all the way to, um, there's a great example on the ECHO website about uh, folks who are incarcerated being connected with mentors. So you can see it can be really applied to a wide range of needs. Um, but the idea is that uh, people are learning together who have varying different disciplines and backgrounds and information to share. Great. And, and for our ECHO, ECHO Autism, you know, one of the goals that we talk about is moving knowledge, not children or not families. Um, can we talk a little bit more about what that means, Amber? Uh, sure. Like Sarah mentioned, this teleconferencing or video conferencing model, obviously, by its very nature, increases accessibility. And um, I'm sure we'll explain a little bit more kind of the design of an ECHO, but it's the, there's this hub and spoke structure to it. Um, so there's participants and then an expert team that's involved. And there's knowledge sharing through this really collaborative network. And because it's delivered using teleconferencing, it really helps overcome some of those barriers that we often see when we're trying to build skill sets or knowledge among providers. So barriers of distance, travel, even time. Um, that usually can impact people's access to face-to-face -face trainings. This teleconferencing model allows easier access and it's much more efficient in sharing that information. So it really allows individuals to connect with providers outside of their region, their state, and our example, um, oftentimes um, out of our country. So you can contact with folks that you would otherwise be able to do efficiently or cost-effectively, um, learn some valuable information, and then immediately apply that information to the family and the community of practice where you 
reside. And so it really is this idea of moving this knowledge through the network to reach all of these regions and has greater impact than for children and families. Yeah, it makes so much sense, um, particularly in the field of autism. Why is ECHO needed um, and, and is it really needed? Um, maybe uh, we could start with you, Dr. Restrepo, on this one. Yeah, sure. So it's very well known now that the prevalence of autism has been increasing over the recent decades. So that has been leading to an increase in demands of evaluations and services for autistic individuals. But that means has outpaced the numbers of specialists and specialty centers where families and children can go and get the services that they need. Um, so that often leads to significant wait lists and barriers for families to obtain the right services at the right time. So these wait lists is, is, are very problematic and especially for people that are like living in underserved areas or rural areas when they have to travel many miles to go to those centers to get the, the services that they need. Um, and then, so as you can imagine, due to the, you know, to the, to the few specialties getting um, those services to everyone, the, the, those autistic children and their families are at risk for unmet healthcare needs. Who can take part in ECHO uh, and what sort of time commitment is required? Um, Sarah, do you think? Sure. So here at the mine, we have two ECHOs that have been ongoing. So we have an autism primary care series and an autism advanced topic series. And our typical ECHO participants are usually medical providers, clinicians, uh, mental health providers, or community-based practitioners, such as through education or other mental health clinics. And um, our, each of our ECHOs occurs once a month for about 90 minutes. Ours are the first and second Thursdays of the month, um, usually from 12 to 1.30. And, um, and there are about six sessions for each series. And uh, one thing that's a great benefit that we haven't mentioned yet is it's a really great way to get CEUs for folks. So from differing backgrounds um, in a very dynamic, interactive way. I myself have to get CEUs and um, I know how um, sometimes painful that can be, but the ECHO is a really great way for folks to get uh, CEUs in this, in this uh, content by um, doing it in very you know, dynamically during the ECHO session. And for someone who yeah. may not know, what's a CEU? Oh, a CEU is like a continuing education credit. So it's a way for um, most people who are licensed um, have to have ongoing training in their field of study. And this uh, can count, which is great. Great. Dr. Restrepo, were you going to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that medical providers can also get CMEs, uh, which is also like a similar credit, but just specifically for our field. I think it would be really helpful to sort of get a sense of what is involved in an echo session. What does the agenda usually include? What does it look like? The topics, etc. cetera. Um, Amber Fitzgerald, could you maybe start this one off for us and, and give us a sure. sense of what echo looks like? Sure, I actually appreciate you asking me. I love Echo. I can't express that enough since I've been a part of the first um, Echo that was offered here at the Mind Institute. And when Viviana and I went through the training together, it really resonated with me. Um, just the idea that we can really share information and teach in a format that's not like a sit and get training, right? You don't attend, turn your video off, listen to someone and then hang up. It's really intentionally designed to create a community of practice. And I can't kind of understate that enough or overstate it enough, I guess, that it's really this idea that people that are involved. So the team, like our team, it's called a hub. Um, and that's like the main team that facilitates the ECHOES meeting and it's really typically consistent. Um, and then we have presenters that join us as well and it could be members of our team or actually we've been really fortunate to have amazing community partners and professionals who've agreed to share topics with our group um, throughout our ECHOES. And then we have the community members, so the participants that sign up to be a part of that and that's called the spokes. So it's really this idea that there's a hub and a spoke component and that's how the information is shared across. So the agenda um, for ECHO session is really specific and intentionally designed to both share information and increase knowledge through brief presentations 
and then case um, presentations by our participants. So there's a lot of knowledge sharing through the case discussion. So I'll share just a little bit of what the agenda looked like, and then maybe Sarah Bibiana wants to share some of our upcoming topics that we're planning for these next ones, because I think those are important to consider too. So if you are a part of our ECHO, what you could expect is there's typically, we always have an introduction for every session. We believe it's really important to acknowledge all the members of the community that are present during each ECHO session. Um, there is always a short talk or can be called a didactic on a specific topic um, that has been outlined in the curriculum for the session. And there's times for um, questions from either our hub team or participants of the presenter. And then we move from that into the case presentation, which really is the heart of the echo. So a participant shares a case with the group um, around for our, our echo, um, an individual with autism that they're working with. It could be an assessment, a diagnostic question, behavioral question, parent support question. It can have a wide range. There's a format we use for the case presentations. And then um, the case presentation is followed up by questions from our um, spokes. So the participants first get to ask any clarifying questions, then we as a team ask questions if needed, and then we end our ECHO session with some specific recommendations. And really, I think the biggest piece about the ECHO is the recommendations come first from our participants, because we know everyone has amazing knowledge and expertise, and we're all learning to increase our skills together. Um, and so that's kind of how the ECHO wraps up with those recommendations. And then those are shared out um, also with the participants afterwards in the document too, so they can reference them for later. And I don't know, for topics, I think it'd be nice to hear kind of for folks to know some of our topics that we're covering. I don't know, Sarah, Bibiana. Uh, sure. So what, Bibiana, do you want to take this one or do you want me to take it? Yeah, so we have, we're being starting two new cohorts in May. So we have one that is more like the introduction to autism, right? So participants are going to hear the most important topics in autism care from early identification, the different evidence-based treatments that are available. Because they're gonna hear about medical considerations and you know, services through the school system. For the autism focused topics that will be focusing on mental health issues, we're gonna be uh, you know, increasing the knowledge and participants about those coexistent medical conditions that are frequently seen in the autistic population. We're going to talk about different treatments and how to support uh, those uh, individuals through mental health challenges. Could you give a couple examples of some of those commonly co-occurring conditions? Yeah, sure. So, for example, we know that approximately 80, uh, up to 81% of children with autism may also receive the diagnosis of anxiety. And about half of them, they also receive the diagnosis of um, ADHD. So that usually gets the picture a little bit more complex and then children and family face even more issues. So we really want providers to think about the child or the individual as a whole, right? And then just taking under consideration those other issues that can actually affect their well-being and, and the, their quality of life. Great, yeah, so many great things to talk about. Um, I can add, Marianne, I think yeah, one please. thing I really love about our ECHO is I, I know that the org organizing team has really um, gotten these topics from the participants themselves. So we've really tried to pay attention to what folks are asking for and what would be practical. So like in Bibiana's example, maybe, um, you know, the topic of the little talk in the beginning is about using screeners for these conditions in clinical practice for like our primary care series for those providers who want a practical way to get knowledge to look for that and then what to do once you um, identify someone with needing those extra needs. So I, I think what's great about it is it's, 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 it is very, you're getting a lot of knowledge, but it's very practical application, which I think is really helpful for, especially for, um, you know, getting those continuing education credits, you feel like you're getting something out of it. Yeah, and that translates to patients as well, which is great. Um, now, ECHO is very interdisciplinary, right? The, the team members all have different areas of expertise, including the three of you. I was wondering if you could each sort of take us through what role you play during an ECHO session. And anyone can start, feel free. <laughs> so I can start. So as a medical provider, I focus on the medical piece. Um, so as I just, I just commented, uh, uh, autistic individuals unfortunately have 
experience even higher rates of mental health issues, medical issues, and you know, throughout many different conditions. So, and many times they have, you know, all those medical cares are not met. Uh, so during our sessions, I make sure that we consider those medical issues that we also think about mental health and the treatments and the pharmacological management that they're receiving, because those pieces can be impacting the child's functioning and their well-being. All right, maybe Sarah Dubeck, you wanna go next? Sure. My role on the team is a psychologist, so I do quite a bit on, um, you know, uh, diagnostic assessment, uh, treatment, what to do next, how to treat the whole family, thinking about what um, I work really closely. We also have a social worker on the team. She and I work closely together thinking about the needs of the family. Um, for autism in particular, thinking about those co-occurring mental health conditions that are there. Um, I'm also a behavior analyst. So Amber and I work together to, to um, focus on um, the behavior aspects of this, often the case presentations um, occurring and how to incorporate the principles of applied behavior analysis to the team. So I think, um, you know, yeah, each of us brings a lot of different, great overlapping knowledge that helps us work together. All right. And Amber Fitzgerald, how about you? Yeah, as Sarah mentioned, so I'm also a behavior analyst. So we do tag team on any specific, you, there's sometimes this underlying themes around behavioral supports or things we can think about so to support the family. Um, and uh, other times cases are specifically around, you know, what are the resources and interventions available to help with um, supporting an individual and in their behavior. I'm also um, an educational specialist in moderate to severe disability. So I have a background in special education. So oftentimes a lot of um, Clinicians and medical providers might have specific questions around understanding early intervention service systems or the school system. And um, my role is to try to impart some general information and resources so the providers can be advocates and help to support and really empower our parents to access services that are available to them. And then I also do a lot of work in the community with families and parent partnerships. So I think all of us actually, Bibiana is there, um, and Robin, who's also on our team as a social worker, also spend a lot of time on helping um, remind providers to consider the family and the, the, the caregivers and think about those parent partnered strategies. And you're all in one place at the same time. That's what's so beautiful, all that knowledge and expertise. Uh, we are discussing the UC Davis Mind Institute's Project ECHO today, and that is an interactive teleconferencing program for providers who are caring for autistic individuals. Two new sessions will be starting in May. I'm Marianne Sharp, and I'm joined by three ECHO experts, Viviana Restrepo, a developmental behavioral pediatrician and associate clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics. Amber Fitzgerald is a board certified behavior behavior analyst, educational specialist, and program manager at the Mind Institute, and Sarah Dufek, a psychologist and faculty member at the Mind Institute, and an assistant professor of clinical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. If you have questions, I encourage you to post them now in the comments, and we will answer them toward the end of the discussion. Um, one of the reasons that we're talking about ECHO today is because the two new sessions are starting in May. And Dr. Restrepo, you talked a little bit about this already. Uh, one is a little more general. One is a little more toward mental health. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what those will look like and maybe who's a good fit for each of the sessions? Yeah, so for the introduction to autism, we are targeting primary care providers, in, you know, the, especially in the Northern California region. So it can be physicians, it can be pediatricians, it can be nurse practitioners. So people that are in the front line, just you know, identifying and helping families to get the answers and to, to get the help that they needed at the right moment. Um, we are also including some other <clears throat> professionals that may have uh, the, the base, may want to get the basic knowledge on autism. And as I said before, getting a broader knowledge, right? Just getting all the medical piece, getting the treatment piece, everything wrap up together in those sessions. For the mental health issues, we're looking for participants that are taking care of that mental health provider and mental health um, issues. So that comes all the way from, um, you know, general um, um, pediatricians and general providers, as well as 
psychologists and school based professionals as well. And, and then people just working with autistic individuals. Uh, we really recommend people that if they have a basic knowledge, um, they would like to get like a more comprehensive, um, um, you know, grasp of the, all those topics, just to start with the introduction to autism, and then they can move uh, to a, a more complex uh, curriculum. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I'm curious what you've heard in the past from participants in terms of the impact that the program has had on them and on the care that they are able to provide to patients and families. Um, maybe start with you, Sarah, on this one. Oh, sure. So, um, you know, like I said, we try to gather a lot of information ongoing as we do the ECHO program so that it, it's very, uh, you know, we do sort of a response. We're very responsive to the needs and, and wants of the group. So, um, in the past, what we've heard back in terms of feedback is that um, the attendees really do like connecting with other professionals. So just in general, I think that sense of fellowship and being together has a really helpful uh, benefit of ECHO, just being together and get, getting information and, and that connection. And then, um, of course, sort of this opportunity to then access information from experts based on topics that apply to their clinical practice. You know, everyone at any point in their career always needs a little, could use a little assist. I think all of us feel that way. Sometimes just bouncing ideas off each other is just a really helpful practice, especially somebody outside of your immediate um, environment, I think is helpful to get a fresh eyes on it. Um, uh, in terms of specific skills gained, we've had reports of like, um, for example, things like getting better at identifying anxiety in their patients with ASD, or when, it, when does certain behaviors sort of spill over into an ADHD diagnosis, um, and sort of then doing planning around that, so identification and planning of those co-occurring co um, conditions. Um, and then I think a real benefit of our program that we have started, as Amber mentioned, is that um, we've really devoted a lot of time to connecting with families in a way that I think is, is really helpful for providers to get practice on and how to actually do that and feel more connected to families and being more empathetic about um, the, uh, the, the things that families face on the daily. Um, what else? Anyone else can feel free to jump in if they like. Amber, did you have anything on that you wanted to add? You know, I think some of the, the information that we've been shared with us, we do feedback evaluations, as we mentioned during each session, and we really use that as an active planning tool to think about um, future topics and the needs of our ECHO participants. But it's also great just to hear their takeaways, right? Because we don't always, we might see some aha moments during the session, but we, we don't know necessarily what resonated or the larger impact. So um, some folks have shared that there's been great information around considering cultural differences um, when you think about the presentation of symptoms. And I also think with how we um, engage and partner with families, just making sure we consider all aspects of an individual and their family. And really um, just a broader general understanding for some of our providers about autism and diagnosis and things to consider. And I know too, um, Bibiana does a wonderful job often talking through some of the medication questions and, and individuals or participants have shared that hearing about medication management tools and things to be mindful of and to consider um, in their practice has also been really helpful. Yeah, I, I know it's hard to measure and you, you've talked about the surveys and all the great feedback that you've had. Um, but do you have a sense of sort of the larger impact of ECHO? You're, you're impacting these providers who are in turn, that's affecting patient care. Um, maybe Dr. Restrepo, what's your sense of whether the program is really accomplishing its goal of improving autism care and availability for patients? Yeah, so we have used different measures to be more objective when we're trying to figure out the impact that we are, you know, having in our participants, and they actually have increased knowledge in all the topics of autism. They all have also said that they have more confidence caring for people with autism and their families, and they also have changed their practices. Um, so, um, so far, we are not measuring patient outcomes, but if you think about it, if you have a professional that knows about your condition, 
that really knows about all the treatments and resources that are available for you. And then it's also providing you the best practices of, of care. We're really hoping that that is going to have a, a great impact in, in, you know, in their medical care and the, the therapeutic care as a whole. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm curious too, as the MIND or as members of the MIND Institute's ECHO team, what do you get out of these sessions? I'm sure it's not a one-way street, right? Um, you talked about you're, you're working with other experts too and other providers. What do you learn from them? Um, you know, what are some of the things you've taken away? And maybe start uh, start with you, Sarah? I would say I had, if I have to choose a couple of things, um, I would say it's so invaluable to speak to people who are on the ground doing the work. I, I do also work in the clinic as part of my job, but I also think that it's really helpful to interact with people from different disciplines in different settings, such service settings. And it really keeps us fresh, I think, in terms of like how are they, especially for example, things designed in research, how that's actually gonna work in the real world. I think that's invaluable. I also, um, like as Amber said, we have folks participating from all over the world. So it's so helpful to hear how things will work given people's cultural differences. So we have, we're so help, you know, fortunate to have attendees from all over. And we've built, I, I believe we've built a relationship with folks where they can really tell us, oh yeah, that's not gonna work <laughs> for, for our folks. And I can tell you exactly why. And I think that that is really helpful for me as a um, practitioner to be able to have access to folks where they can tell me things um, and then we can have really great, genuine conversations about how things work or don't work. So I would say that's probably the biggest benefit I've found for me so personally. Dr. Restrepo, what about you? Yeah, I think we all learn from each other. And, you know, it has been great to connect with such an amazing group of professionals. Um, we learn about their own barriers and difficulties in their own communities. And it has been re a really humble experience just to get to you know people that are working so hard to improve autism care in their communities. Amber, anything to add about what you get out of the sessions? Yeah, I think, you know, um, through all my work, like in the schools and with families and um, within the research, I just feel like a community of practice is so critical for all of us. Not only um, do we get a chance to share information, but I really think more importantly, we learn through each other's experiences, their, their expertise and their perspectives. And um, I just think ECHO makes this a priority. It really identifies that collaboration and community is critical. And so what I get from it, I think, is usually a boost again of um, like motivation. There's so many folks you hear with amazing ideas or insights on cases or really wonderful questions that make you think and improve your knowledge through the case presentations or through their question. And I really am um, impressed with our ECHO community that attends and how diligent they are with sharing information, getting information and just being open to having these really important dialogues with one another. Great. We actually had a question come in, um, which is about the next thing I was going to ask you is in addition to the echo uh, in English, we also had a Spanish version of echo a couple of sessions. I know Dr. Restrepo, you've been heavily involved. We had a question about how um, people could be a part of the echo project from Latin America. And I'm wondering, Dr. Restrepo, could you talk about what the reception was like um, and why we did hold these two Spanish echo autism sessions? Yeah, those are excellent questions. So we actually started Echo Autism as the idea of our participants. You know, we really take seriously their feedback and they really wanted to participate in something that were in their native language that were, you know, that was that they were more interactive and it was more accessible for a different group of people that might not be bilingual. So we have been offering this Echo Autism curriculum in, in Spanish. Now we have two different cohorts so far. Um, so we have the second one almost about to graduate. And um, our hope team is proficient in Spanish. Uh, so we have uh, another set of members. So our, our actually our whole group of people of Echo is quite big right now at this moment here at the mine. 
So this version is it's just like Amber said, it's just a community of practice. So we have actually a lot of experts from Latin America. So we have psychiatrists, neurologists, which have been very, very enriching for our, for our sessions. And we realized that even though that they're the, you know, the experts in their communities, they still need that extra help, right? That interactive, let's think about through this case, how can we help this family? So it has been, it has been an amazing experience. We still accepting more participants and you can find more information to our web, web uh, site and then we can have it in, in our comments as well. Um, so when I think about the Echo Spanish, I really think that this version truly reflects the project Echo. Uh, you know, the, it, because it really has this global conceptualization of how can we serve people in underserved places without any profit. Great, and you, you just touched on this. We have a couple of other questions we'll get to in a second, but I just wanna cover the nuts and bolts for providers who may be interested in signing up. Uh, the deadline, I believe is April 29th. Is that right for the May sessions? Correct. And how to register, we are gonna post um, the website, uh, the webpage in our comments, as well as the email. Should they email to sign up? How should someone sign up? Yeah, so we're very flexible. So participants can contact us through email. They can also go to the web page and just, um, you know, complete the, the thermographic information. So we are very accessible as well. So just send us your emails. If you really want to change how, uh, you know, your uh, autism is fair in your communities, contact us and we'll be happy to partner with you. All right, wonderful. We do have a couple of questions that I wanted to get to. The first one is, can graduate students and psychology interns participate? I have my own patients right now under the supervision of a licensed psychologist that have autism and I would like to participate in something like this. All right, it's a good question. Yes, I think that would be, that person would be a wonderful addition to our team and would find it very helpful. I think um, we love Echoes where everyone is from different disciplines and varying processes in their career. So I think it's um, my trainees who have attended really enjoyed it. They really felt like they got to see what everybody's different jobs are. So, so absolutely, that would be a great batch, I think. Excellent. Okay. And I think Dr. Restrepo, you sort of touched on this a little bit already, but this question is, in which ways has ECHO partnered with community members, some of whom may not have a medical background to help educate underserved communities within the Sacramento region? So maybe that's also more about Greater Mind Institute outreach, um, as well as ECHO itself. Um, yeah, so I think the Mind Institute, I mean, if you even think about the history of the Mind Institute, it was the idea of parents, right? So I, I, I do feel that we have this close relationship with our communities and there is so many services and so many programs and probably I don't know about everything about every single program because every time I hear someone is doing something amazing. So we have from parent support, we also have, a, we have our experts talking to families as well and through different type of talks that are pretty available and posted in our website. We actually have ADEP modules that are focused on behavior and how to help um, you know, families with children with autism. We also have um, from two of our great researchers here at the mind, we have Help is in Your Hands. And that is actually targeting those families that are concerned about some socialization or you know, skills that, of the, the, the young children may present and it's freely available. So parents can get you know, all those behavioral tricks. So I, I, we can probably spend the whole day talking about the different um, resources that the Mind Institute have. And, you know, and, and I don't know if that Sarah or Amber can um, want to add something to that. I know it's a long list. It is. I think I would just like to add one quick thing about, and we can um, provide a resource, um, but one of the programs I'm on is Mind the Gap, and it's a community-based um, parent partnership program intended to support families who are new to a diagnosis um, and get connected with their family resource center. So in our region, we have Warmline and Family Soup are both um, implementing the Mind the Gap program, and they have information on both of their websites and families who are interested 
um, to get some support around navigating this really complicated system at times. It's a really great program and it's completely free and accessible to all families who are interested. So I definitely would um, look for Mind the Gap program on those family resource um, center sites. Yeah, we can post that link as well as the help that is in your hands link, which you mentioned, Dr. Estrepo. Um, and the Mind Institute is also making a huge effort to increase the diversity of research participants. Um, we can post a story that we recently did about that as well, if that's something you might be interested in um, working with. The goal is to partnership partner is a partnership with communities as opposed to um, here, here's research we want to do. We want them to have a voice in what, what we're going to research. So we'll post all of those um, as well as parent support groups. So check it out. Were you going to add something, Dr. Strepp? I'm sorry. Yeah, I also wanted to say that the Mind Institute is also very strategic about you know, hiring people and having faculty members and clinicians and researchers that actually reflect the population as well. So we have people from different backgrounds where I think it's so important when you have that connection with your provider. So I just wanted to add that the diversity is, and you can feel the diversity once you, when, once you walk in here at the Mind Institute. Absolutely. Okay, we have one last question. I think this will, will be our last one. Um, would ECHO be appropriate for parents or grandparents? It's a very good question. Um, who would like to take that one? I can take that one if that helps. Great. So, um, you know, our ECHO at the Mind Institute right now is geared towards professionals. That's the way it was designed and, and it's really designed to better serve providers. Um, there are ECHOs for parents. We don't have one at the Mind, but we are very open to developing one and are interested in that. Um, but some of the resources like that Amber just described with um, Warm Line and Mind the Gap um, are really more appropriate and geared towards parents. It would be better, it, they would be better serviced to parents or grandparents who are seeking that kind of um, services and support. Um, but for sure, we would love to have all differing types of echoes serving all folks. So we're, we're uh, definitely considering that and would, would, be, would be interested in folks' um, input on that if they would like something like that. Yeah, and the parent support groups too would provide that connection with other families, um, which is great. So we will post some of those links too. All mm -hmm. right, this has been wonderful. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Really appreciate all three of you sharing your time and expertise. Sure, thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this UC Davis Mind Institute Facebook Live. If you do have just one more question that you just came up with, you can still post it in the comments and our experts will try to answer them. And we encourage you to please share this post if you have family and friends who you think would enjoy learning from us. Thanks for joining us. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.